Amen. So we'll be in 2 Thessalonians today, but we're also going to be in the book of Genesis. You can flip to Genesis 37. It's kind of the two, um, the two big places that we'll be today. Um, so we're finishing up. We thought we were going to be finishing up last week the, the letter to, to the, the second letter to the church in Thessalonica. But um, we ran out of time, and so we're going to have uh, some time this week to finish it up. And then next week, we're going to go into a series. Um, we're going to keep going. Um, if you look, the page to the right is First Timothy. And so the series is going to be called Remain, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Super cool um, study that we're going to be going through as we, for the last, I don't even know how many months, we've been studying what Paul had to say to the church. Starting next week, we're going to be talking about what Paul has to say to a young pastor. So it's neat because we're going to learn about leadership. We're going to learn about how do you, how do you serve the Lord in a healthy way, especially when a community that you're in does not agree with what you're doing. And so it'll be neat. So read ahead next week so that when we go into 1 Timothy, if you have any questions, you can bring them with you as we work our way through this, uh, this book. First and 2 Timothy are... I know I say this a lot, one of my favorite books of the Bible, but it is just, it is a really cool place, especially if you're trying to figure out how to walk with the Lord and how to start doing the Christian walk. So read ahead to second or first and second Timothy as we dig into those next week. But back to our time today as we finish up the book in, um, in Thessalonians. So we, we talked about last week, there's three main things that Paul was saying to this church in Thessalonica. And we got to go over the first two last week. And the third one, it's very interesting. The big warning that he's going to give us today, the warning that he's going to really point out to us is idleness. Right? And, and it, it's interesting because idleness isn't usually one of the big threats that we talk about in the Christian walk. But Paul is going to say to this group, guys, we talked about it in the first letter that I sent to you. And remember, just a couple weeks ago, he was saying to, in 1 Thessalonians, to live a quiet life, work with your hands. And remember how he was talking to them about working hard and working hard for the Lord. Well, it seems like as Silas and Timothy took this letter, hung out with the church a little bit, came back to Paul, this issue, it looks like, has gotten worse. And it's idleness, and it's this secret, uh, secret thing that we don't always understand and that we don't always know. But here's the thing. In the Christian life, there's two directions that you're going. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. And you go, but what if I'm like paused trying to figure it out? There's only two ways to be going in the Christian life, forward or backwards. And it kind of reminds me of a jet ski that we used to have growing up. We had one of these sweet sea doos, right? And the thing with a sea doo is that you're always, when you turn it on, you're an idol. Now, when you hit the gas, shoom, you're taking off. But as soon as you take your hand off the gas, you are slowing down because it's automatically an idol. That's the same exact way that it is in the Christian life. You are either shoom, shoom, taking off going forward. Or you're going backwards or you're idle. And so this is one of those studies where you go, man, this looks a lot different than I thought it would. And why is that such a big deal? What if I'm just trying to figure out things? Well, we'll learn about that today. So let's turn to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to parallel it with one character from the Old Testament that I think just did an awesome job of dealing and fighting off idleness. And so we'll kind of parallel these two today as we look at (coughs) Paul... This character from the Old Testament, and then what does that look like in our lives? But before we get to the warning, he, I love how Paul talks because it reminds me of somebody that I know. He kind of has a a way of setting it up for us. And what he says in chapter 3 is, finally, brethren. Finally, brethren. Okay, we've talked about this before. You could kind of circle it or underline it and write next to it in your Bible. Pay attention. Right? Anytime we see finally, it's kind of like usually at the end of a message, I will say something like, guys, if you don't get anything from today's message, get this. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. Listen, if you tuned out at any part of this reading of this letter, I want you to wake up, pay attention, write this down, because this is important. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us. 
Right now, before he goes into his point, he's going to give us some mini points, which doesn't that happen all the time? Like, let me tell you, I got one more thing to tell you, and then you guys are here for a half an hour later. And then I go, okay, last point. That's kind of how Paul, it's like he just has so many nuggets to give. And so he says, finally, pray for us. And then he goes into three areas to pray for us. Pray for us that the word of the Lord, Lord may run swiftly. I like that. I like that Paul always understood the power of prayer. I like that he was always talking about praying for people and asking people to pray for for him. And I think that's so important. I know that ministering is it's a very interesting thing because we've learned, Megan and I have learned, and we now at Calvary have learned that when you go to do a work of the Lord, it gets opposed by the enemy. <coughs> And it's hard to go into a community. Because a lot of times that community doesn't want you to come in. And it's because Satan has hold of the community. And it can be difficult. And so it's interesting to have, or it's important to have people praying for you. And I love that because Paul knows it. He, under, he understands it. Being a pastor, it's, it's difficult work. It's the best work. But it's also difficult because there is this dark attack that comes for when you start serving the Lord. And you'll see it whenever you start serving. Right? You can be going to church. You could be having a great time. You go, this is wonderful. And then you say, you know what? I'm going to start serving. And as soon as you start serving the Lord, it's like things start to go funky. And that's because the enemy doesn't like that you're serving him. He wants you to keep all those gifts that he's given to you. Or Satan wants you to keep all those gifts that God has given to you. He wants you to keep them to yourself. You think about Billy Graham before he became Billy Graham. Satan probably didn't want him to start preaching. Because he knew once this dude starts opening his mouth, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Billy Graham, they say, brought like a million plus people to the Lord. And Satan looks on and goes, no, nah, let's, let's discourage him before he, we can even get him going. That's exactly how it is with us. One of us guys could be the next Billy Graham. We could be the next, there's so many different things that the Lord might be doing. And as you start serving and start figuring out what those gifts are, Satan's going to come against you and go, no, no, no. You don't need to do that. Start giving you, making you nervous and making you anxious. And so Paul understands what it's like to serve. And he asks for prayer for it. He says, he goes on. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. Isn't that cool to think about? That that the, the word of the Lord would run swiftly? Think about, isn't that an awesome prayer for us in the community in Seneca County and in Tiffin? Pray that the word of the Lord would run swiftly throughout the businesses in downtown Tiffin. Pray that the word of the Lord would run swiftly at Tiffin University in Heidelberg. Isn't that a cool prayer? I mean, it'd be neat if we could see Bible studies popping up all over the places. That's his prayer. He says, and that the Lord may be glorified just as it is with you. He then says, and that it may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men For not all have faith. Now before he gets into his warning, he's about to drop just an awesome gospel bomb on us. And the next part, it kind of lays the foundation for the rest of the chapter for us. He says, but the Lord is faithful. But the Lord is faithful. And that's, that's a verse that we should have underlined. Here's one of the things that I've loved about coming to know the Lord. Is that this whole entire book is filled with God showing how faithful He is. From the very beginning all the way till the end. There is prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that God has fulfilled. And He does that to increase our faith. We also have person after person after person after person where you look on and you say, man... This is one of the hardest calls that I've ever seen. And then God continues to fulfill those promises. It's awesome. He says, But the Lord is faithful who will establish and guard you from the evil one. So two ways that he says 
that God is faithful. First way is, is that He will guard you. You go, what, what, what are we talking about here? How are you going to say, Ben, that God is going to guard me when we're reading a book by a guy who died of capital punishment? How exactly was he guarded if he was killed for a crime that he didn't commit? So the interesting thing that we see with the Lord is that God will guard you to fulfill the calling that he has for you to do. Now think about Paul's life. Paul was beaten, put in prison. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was all of these different things. And yet, remember when he was bit by a snake? And, he's, and it shook it off and, you know, it was a dangerous snake and it didn't even, the venom didn't go into him. What it isn't saying here is that bad things, it doesn't say that bad things won't happen to you. What it says is that God is going to guard you. And that's interesting, that's different from us getting hurt, right? What it's saying is he is going to guard you so that you can fulfill the call that he has on your life. Kind of like Joseph, right? Let's flip to Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 37, Because Joseph has one of those calls where it's a a one-of-a-kind call. It's one of those calls that I don't know that any of us would ever want to have on our lives. But when we look back at it, we can see how faithful God is. Let's look at this guy named Joseph. Now remember, his dad is Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says, chapter 37, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And there is the history of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. Now underline that because we know the age of the guy that we're dealing with. He was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with his sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report to them to his father. Now Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his other children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers and he said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream which you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept this matter in his mind. Then his brothers went to feed their flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to them, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. And so he sent out to the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? And so he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell them where they are feeding their flocks. And the the man said to them, They have departed from here. And I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went for his brothers, and they found him in Dothan. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come now, come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered out of his hands, and he said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to him, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands, and bring him back to his father. 
So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked. There was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And not let our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by, and so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and he, indeed, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more. And I, well, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of goats, dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it's our son's, your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it, and he said, It's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then jo- Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and a captain of the guard. Brutal, right? That is a really, really tough call. You got to know about Joseph is that his dad had several wives. Okay, it's a mess. You can read a couple chapters before. But there was one wife that his dad absolutely loved. And she had a son. His name was Joseph. And so you can understand that the other brothers were pretty jealous of Joseph. They're jealous because his dad loved him more than all the other brothers. He gave him this tunic of many colors. But then they come up with this plan to kill him. Now, a lot of times we read about Joseph and we go, oh my goodness, that is the worst call ever. But did you notice that at first they sent out to kill him? But God guarded them. He guarded him against his brothers. Okay, the plan was to murder him. But something came on their hearts. And that's God's protection around Joseph. You see, you can look at it and say, that is the worst story that I've ever heard. I can't imagine being sold into slavery by my siblings. But you also have to look on and see that God was guarding Joseph even in the midst of the worst case scenario. The interesting thing is that that's exactly what He does with us. God has a call for each one of us to do. And if we will walk after Him, He will guard us until the time where that calling is fulfilled. So if you go back to Paul, and you think about it with Paul, Paul had a very interesting call on his life. right? But he started going down the wrong path. He was killing Christians. He was having them imprisoned. Jesus shows up. Paul gives his life to the Lord. And he turns his life in a much different path. Paul goes on to author more books of the New Testament than anybody else. But as soon as his last book was written, we realize that Paul was killed. That's exactly how it goes with us. Okay? We are on earth to fulfill the call that God has on our life. As soon as that's over, He'll take us. And so often we can look around and we can go, oh my goodness, look at all these terrible things that are happening. We've got to be focused on what God has called us to do and He will guard us until it is fulfilled. Go back to 2 Thessalonians because it says the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you. Second thing to note there is, is that He will establish you. You go back and think about how we started that chapter with Joseph. How old did it say that he was? 
17 years old. Now think about that. A lot of times we can go, oh my goodness, this guy was taken in the prime of his life and put into (laughs) slavery. But you also have to remember that he had 17 years to be established with his dad. He had 17 years of learning how to be a man. He had 17 years of getting prepared. Megan and I always talk about we have 18 years with our kids. We have 18 years and then they're going to be off to do something. And we have, and almost when you talk about it, I start to feel like, oh my goodness, Roman's about to turn six. This is getting closer and closer and closer. But listen, that's, that's the truth of it. They say that the first eight years of a person's life can solidify like up to 90% of what, they're gonna, what their core beliefs are going to be. Eight years old. And you think about, man, yeah, he was taken in the prime of his career or of prime of his life, but he had 17 years to develop into the man that God had created him to be. And what's amazing is a lot of times we forget that God is establishing us. And we've got to be thankful for those things. I think about the people that were in my life that helped establish me in the Lord. I came to know the Lord like 20-something years old. Right now I was a mess. And the Lord placed a couple people around me that were just pivotal in helping me to grow in His ways. One of them was Pastor Jerry, which you guys got to meet. And that guy... The Lord, He put him in my life to teach me how to walk as a man, to learn how to be a husband, to learn how to be a Christian. And I'm so thankful because He helped me to to get those roots deep. Think about a couple guys that I had with me in men's ministry where I would come in every Monday night. We had men's ministry at our church. And guys, when I gave my life to the Lord, I was a mess. I was struggling with alcohol and porn. I just stopped smoking Megan and I were sleeping together and trying to figure out how to not sleep together anymore because I was really attracted to her, but I didn't want to be attracted to her yet. And I was trying to figure out, should I move out? Should we be together? And every Monday I would come in and I would be reading my Bible and I would just pour out my heart and soul to these guys. And I think back on like, man, they had to think that I was such a mess. But we had guys in there, some of them been walking with the Lord for 40 and 50 years. The Lord brought a high school student dude in that was, he was just trying to figure it out. And it was like we were all figuring this Christian walk out together. A couple guys in men's ministry that led different groups that would pull me aside. Hey, let me pray with you about that. Hey, what are you guys going to do about this whole getting married and living together? And what's that going to look like? And I had so many people that helped me figure out, okay, how is this all going to work? Because there were times where I was just panicked. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord put these people in my life to go, come on, we're going to be all right. We're going to make it through. And I'm so thankful for them. Now, what's interesting is, who is that in your life? Who is it that the Lord has placed in your life to help establish you? Who is it that the Lord is placing in your life that He wants you to help establish because it's what he does. When Jesus came and hit the scene, what was his, one of the first things that he did with ministry? He went and found some people that were working, and he said, come, let's do life together. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And he helped establish them in what they were doing. And then those guys started discipling other guys. And then those guys started discipling other guys and gals. And that is his process of growing his church is establishing people through discipleship. Same exact thing that he did with Joseph. He put people in his life to help establish him. Even when Paul was in jail, we saw that he had people with him. Acts chapter 16, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, him and Silas are stuck in jail. It's midnight. And they start praising the Lord. Earthquake happens. All the chains fall off the prisoners. and All these people get saved. And the Lord helped Paul. That's the way that he does things. And so if you go back to 2 Thessalonians, isn't it awesome? That the Lord is faithful in two areas, he says there. He says, number one, he will guard you. And number one, he will establish you. 
At the end of our time today, we're going to have a little bit of time to pray. And one of the things that we want to write down to pray for is, I want you to fill in the blank. Thank you, Lord, for putting blank in my life to help establish me. Or if you don't have anybody there, you can say, Lord, please place somebody in my life to help establish me in your ways. You could also thank the Lord for how He is using you to establish somebody else. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Isn't that a cool little prayer that he throws in there? May the Lord direct your heart into the love of God and the patience of Christ. If there is a prayer that we could pray for each other this week, it is that the Lord would direct your hearts into the love of God because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. I mean, as soon as we get out of here, isn't, doesn't it just seem like things get in chaos again? Right, you start. You as soon as you come out of the YMCA, it's like some somebody will cut you off, or you'll hit a pothole, and then you order food, and the order gets wrong, and then you go into work, and your boss is all kinds of upset at you, or your teacher gives you a pop quiz, and then the next thing you know, you're, how did we get here? I felt so great after church, and now I want to give up. May the Lord direct your heart into the love of God. God has this love that is a self-sacrificial love. And so when those things come this week, I pray that you will have that self-sacrificial love for the people that you come in contact with. I also pray that you have the patience of Jesus. They always say don't pray for patience because then the Lord will send you something to help give you your patience, right? Another word for patience is long-suffering. And none of us love long-suffering. But I pray that you guys will have the patience of Christ this week. I know what it's like to get back into the Monday routine. In fact, it even comes on Sunday, doesn't it? Sunday evening. I pray that the Lord will give you His patience. Now let's get into the third warning from 2 Thessalonians. He says, But we command you, Brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received for us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anybody's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Did you catch the the warning? So a group of people within this church, they've become idle. Now there's a couple different theories on what they were actually doing. Now some people say that they were just lazy. They, they, They were just lazy people. They didn't want to work. And they mooched off of the church and everything else in the community. Another one is that they, they thought that Jesus was coming back like this week. And if Jesus is coming back this week, that means that I don't need to go to work tomorrow. So they quit their jobs. Okay, but then Jesus didn't show up. And now they have no money. And they are living off of the community and off the church again. And in both cases, Paul is saying, don't do that. <clears throat> Don't be idle. Right? And, and if you go back to this section, he says it with even a very strong word. If you go back to the, the in verse 6, underline the command. Right? He says, but we command you, brethren. Now that command is kind of like a term for ranks in the army. Okay, and what he is saying is, I'm commanding you like giving an order in the army. 
Now, what happens in the army if one commander gives an order to the person that's under him and he doesn't do it? Well, they have chaos. They have disorder. That's why so much of the, of the army and the armed forces is they have to train discipline. Because if you have this many people fighting, you all have to be on the same page. He says that's the same exact way that it is in the Christian life. I'm giving you the command to be a good worker. The problem is, is that right now you're not. And it's causing disorder. Look, verse 11. For we hear that, that, that there are some among you who walk in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. And so here's his tip to us as we work throughout the week. Work hard. Work hard. Be a person that has a really good work ethic. Now he gives us a couple things just to note in how we practically do this. Number Verse number 6, or verse 6, look at what he says. His command to us is, if there are people that are these lazy types of people that are mooching off of the community in the church, he says, number one, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. You go, Ben, we as Christians, we're not supposed to withdraw from people. We're supposed to serve people. Here's an interesting thing for us to understand with walking together as Christians. Okay, we are supposed to go and take light into darkness. But that doesn't mean that we hang out in darkness all the time. There are only a certain people that you should be friends with. That doesn't mean that there are certain people that you shouldn't associate or get to know. But there are certain people that you shouldn't bring into your inner circle if they're going to be bad for you. It is the same exact way in the Christian life, right? We give our lives to Jesus and we think we, we're supposed to serve everybody and love everybody and we're supposed to just suffer through in every single relationship. No, that's not the case. There are people that are going to be our close friends. And I would suggest that you be careful about who you let into that circle. Because they're the ones that are going to have access to who you are. And if they're lazy people, it can rub off on you and you can become a lazy person. That doesn't mean that you know you get up after this message is done and you tell the person next to you in your seat, you know, you are a lazy person, I'm done with you, you're cut off. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the person that you really do life with. He goes, be careful if that person is lazy. And he gives you the way to do it in verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you. So Paul says, follow our example. We were not disorderly when we were among you. We were in order. And what do we know about Paul? We've talked about it as we went through the book of Acts and we've studied the other epistles. Is That dude was a hard worker. When he would go into a town, his trade was tent making. Now this was a guy who was very high and powerful when he was in the Jewish faith. We know that power and money comes with that position. He left that behind to become a church planner and to become a writer. And he didn't have the money to just live off of what he was doing and go from city to city. So he would go into a city, he would get a job, and he would work hard. Now some of the churches blessed him with a financial gift, and he didn't have to go and tent make in those towns. But then he would go on to the next town, he would have run out of money, and he would do the same exact thing. And what do we learn from that as we as Christians should not be living off of the people in the church and the community. We should be the type of people that we come in and we're able to get a job and to work hard. Because... People are looking at us and they're watching us. Verse 9, he says again, Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. He says, listen, if you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. And, and, and isn't that a totally different thinking than we have in the church? 
Right? We typically feel like we're supposed to just give everything away and everybody can have everything. He goes, no, to us. Right? The way that we love on the community is going to be totally different than the way that we act as Christians. We're going to work hard so that we can give things away. But that doesn't mean that everybody's just going to quit their job. You come in here and expect us to be able to pay for everything. He goes, no, that is not the way to do ministry. Actually, reverse it. Work hard so that you don't become a burden in the community. He says, if you don't work hard, you don't eat. That's another one. You know the the emoji with the big eyeballs? That's what I think of when I read that section. Wow. That is some truth. If we are not working hard, we should not be eating is what he says. So he says, listen, guys, have a good worth ethic. Paul had a good work ethic. And you know what else? Joseph had a good work ethic. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis 39, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Well, look at how this guy worked. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him to the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made All that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of the house. And all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from that time that he had made him overseer of his house. And all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus... He left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Let's pause right there for a minute. This dude is a slave. He got sold into slavery. And what did he do? Did he moan? Did he get frustrated with what what the Lord was doing or not doing? It said that he worked hard. He worked so hard that he became in command of this guy named Potiphar, which is a slave owner. He became in charge of his house. He worked so hard that the Lord was with him. And it says that he blessed this guy's house. Oh, isn't it interesting to have that type of a work ethic? Do you have the type of work ethic that, man, if you work at the grocery store, you stock shelves better than anybody else in there? That that store becomes profitable because of how well you stock shelves. And you are the type of person that, man, it doesn't matter where you work. If you're a CEO, if you're an entry level, that you're the type of worker that comes in and ultimately the team gets better. This guy is a slave. And he is working unto the Lord. He has got a really good work ethic. So did Paul. Paul was a hard worker, man. I can't imagine going through some of the stuff that Paul did. Right? They, he'd go into a town, he'd share the gospel. Just to, to be like us going into Fostoria and doing a Bible study. And they stoned him. Or they beat him. Or they arrested him. And what is he trying to do? He's sharing the love of Jesus with him. Can you imagine if we all said, you know what, we're going to do a Bible study in Fostoria next week, and we went there and they just beat us and arrested us? Our, our first response would probably be, well, maybe we should pick Fremont. I don't know about this. We'd probably be upset. We'd be discouraged. But Paul wasn't like that. He just said, okay, it's time to move on. And he went to the next place, and he went to the next place, and he went to the next place, and he went to the next place. That guy was a hard worker. It's the same exact way that we have to be. Here's the thing. If you remember, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and Adam and Eve fell. Actually, before that, when God placed Adam in the garden, what did he tell him to do? Told him to tend the garden, right? That's right, Madison. Work. The curse came, and God said, your work's going to be harder. 
But Adam was a worker. Think about what was Moses doing when he got the call from God to come and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Do you guys remember what he was doing? He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd out with sheep. His best buddies were sheep. He was a hard worker. They say the shepherding was a really tough job. Nasty. Caring for sheep. You ever been around sheep? They poop all over the place. They get stuff all over their eyes. They're dumb. Right? They get themselves into trouble all the time. And so you, you just got to go around and care for them. Where did this guy go? Oh my goodness. And you, you get to, that's caring for sheep. But Moses was a hard worker. What was David doing when he got his call? Remember? He was a shepherd. He was a hard worker. And they didn't even, his dad didn't even dignify David with calling him in. He called all of his other brothers and left David out in the field. David was a hard worker. Think about when Jesus hit the scene. Who did he call to be his disciples? Fishermen. And they were working. They were hard working. Fishermen was a tough job. And they, we've learned from, from studying different scholars about how it looks like John had multiple uh, boats. He was building a fishing business. These guys were hard workers. Our Lord and Savior, before he started his ministry, he was a, a carpenter. Worked with wood. Created chairs. And this is the Lord of all creation. He has access to everything. If you were the Lord, would you have been a carpenter? Come on. I, don't, I, I, can, I can make my food out of nothing. Let me get you a lunch. I will turn that in. I'll feed this whole entire place right now, right? But he works. Why? To give us an example. God is a hard worker. And so are we. Guys, we've got to be careful with idleness. Because it can be just absolutely self-destructive for us. Let's go to verse 12. He now says, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Now in verse 12, you could underline the word exhort. Next to it, you could write encourage. Okay, encourage, exhort are kind of interchangeable words. He says to the group that are struggling with idleness, he goes, I want you to work in quietness and eat your own bread. Work, eat in quietness. Isn't that a good word? We should just work hard, be quiet, try to do the best that we can and provide for our family. What a ministry that is. Just take care of your family. Take care of those things that are around you. And then he says in verse 13, But as for you, brethren, and now he's talking to everybody else, listen to what he has to say. This is one of my favorite verses. Come on. Verse 13, it says, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. I love that. I think that's a word that probably a lot of us in here need to hear. What you're doing right now, it may seem minimal. It may seem like the work that you're doing, whether with your family or the job that you're doing. You may have the worst job in the world right now. But do not grow weary in doing what is good. That means that if you are working a job where you're in a grocery store, you're probably not going to do that forever. But while you're doing it, work hard and don't grow weary in doing good. I can remember when I gave my life to Jesus, man. I, I really wanted to be a pastor but I hated my job. Like I, I hated my job. And then I got into a corporate sales job and I really didn't like that one that much better. And then I went to the YMCA and I liked that one a little bit more. But what I learned was no matter where I went, it really didn't have that much to do with the job. It had to do with was I going to work under the Lord? Was I going to keep going? And that is so important. Do not grow weary in doing what is good. Paul did not grow weary in doing what is good. And neither did Joseph. Let's flip back and let's see what happened to Joseph next. 
Genesis 39, verse verse, uh, 7. Look at what happened to Joseph. It says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and he said, Lie with me. But he refused. And he said to the master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all things into my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Man, is that an awesome, an awesome thing to have done, right? And you think, okay, if you don't actually know what happens next, you think, oh man, God is going to bless him for this amazing thing that he just said. I'm not going to sleep with you. You belong to my master. And how in the world could I do that? If I did that, I would defile God and I can't do that. But then look what happens. So it was. As she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, she, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me and cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up his voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled outside. And so she kept the garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these saying, the Hebrew servant who you've brought to us came in to me to mock me. Right next to that, you could write, liar. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when the master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And there he was, and he was there in the prison. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed into Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were with him in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, he made it prosper. Do not grow weary in doing what is good. That's got to be one of the hardest things in the world, right? So he's working as hard as he can in this slave house. He's in the prime of his life. Everything that he is doing, he is now getting rewarded for. And you got to think, he's like, okay, Lord, this is great. I'm going to work my way out of this, right? And then as he gets this pristine position in the house... The guy's wife comes on to him. She says, come lie with me. He goes, no, I can't do that. And she keeps coming again and again and again. And then she grabs him, tries to seduce him, and he runs away. He does what is right. And it says that she then says this Hebrew. Okay, now we know what type of language that is. Right? She's not just saying this prisoner dude. No, she's... She's now talking about his background. She's talking about him as a Hebrew, right? And so we know what it's like whenever we hear somebody talk about somebody's background or their upbringing or the color of their skin, right? This is wrong what she's doing. It's disgusting. It didn't have to be said, but this is an evil lady. Her husband believes her, throws Joseph in prison. And you can only imagine, right? If you're Joseph, Lord, what is up with this? I mean, I, I continuously have been trying to do the right thing, but I, it just keeps getting worse. He gets thrown into prison, but it doesn't, we didn't read anywhere in there where he stopped working. And he could have, right? He could have just been a, a 
could have just been a bum, not done his work, but he worked hard. Even when he was in jail, he worked hard. And it says that he got favor from the Lord. And he started working his way up in jail. Now, the amazing thing that, we're gonna, that we read, if you keep going, is that the Lord blessed him exceedingly within that place. So guys, you have to keep going. No matter where you are right now, the Lord is faithful. And you have got to keep doing what you're doing because we're working unto the Lord. Let's finish up. He says, And if anyone does not obey the word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, that's another practical example for us. Be careful of anybody that doesn't obey this, 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 this epistle. Take note of people that don't listen to the word of God. If anybody does not obey this word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Okay, that's our practical way for us to, who should we be in, in, in fellowship with? Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, so those people aren't enemies. Okay, but we're trying to get them to the place where they understand that we have to listen to what the Lord is saying. And here's where we end. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The last thing, the last little nugget for us today is may the Lord give you peace. May the Lord give you peace. That's an interesting thing, right? Because one of the titles that we learn about the Lord is that Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. This is awesome thing that he ends with here at the end. And in all of this craziness that he has talked about that is happening and being a hard worker and not being idle, he says, may the Lord give you peace. We've talked about two guys today that are in the midst of absolute chaos. Absolute chaos. But the interesting thing is that the Lord has this way of taking chaos, right? And, and we all have chaos around us, right? If I were to take any of you and just talk about your last couple weeks, it would probably be chaos, right? We just have a, a way of anything that happens in our world is absolute chaos, the amazing thing is, and this is a lot easier to, to see when you look back at things instead of looking what you're dealing with right now, is that these two guys were in the midst of chaos, but they didn't know that the Lord was working it together for peace. If you think about Joseph, we're not going to read the rest of his story, but think about what happens to him next. So he's there in the prison, right? And he is stuck. He cannot get out. But over here, the Lord sends a dream to Pharaoh. Actually, hold on. He's got two prisoners next to him, right? He's got two prisoners next to him. He sorts out their dreams. One of them ends up getting killed and the other one gets restored back. And he says to the one prisoner, when you get restored, don't forget me. And guess what? He forgets him. And Joseph is stuck rotting in jail again. Right now... Over here, Joseph in his chaos, craziness, stuck in jail, which I think we would all consider chaos, right? Over here, God sends the Pharaoh a dream. Now, what happens over here is that the Pharaoh starts going crazy. What is this dream? What does it mean? Now, the guy that had been in jail that was his servant is now, light bulb goes off and he goes, wait a minute. I know this guy. I was in jail with. He interpreted my dream to get back into your service. He will be able to do it. So he calls for Joseph and he takes him out of the chaos and he brings him before him. Now, if you were Joseph, think about how you would be with dreams. 17 years old, the Lord gave him two dreams, remember? People are going to bow down before you, your family, 
your relatives. Last time that he shared dreams, he ended up almost getting killed and sold into slavery. So you would probably be hesitant. Joseph isn't. Because he knows that God is faithful. And so he says to Pharaoh, here's your dream. The dream that you had, there's going to be a severe famine that's going to come. But you're going to have some really good years first. Okay, so you need to save up in these years of abundance for the, for the years of um, drought that are coming. Pharaoh says to him, man, that's good. You know what? That is so good that I'm going to put you in charge of this whole entire thing. And Joseph goes from being in jail to being second in command of Egypt. Just like that. Now, it's easy to look back and go, Joe, it's going to work out. I'm telling you that through, if you were living that out, that had to be super hard to deal with. And every, I'm trying to do what is right. I'm trying to do this. And then this lady comes on to me, tries to sexually misconduct, does all this stuff to me, man. I'm trying to do what's right. I'm just trying to live. And she then tells this lie about me. I get put in jail. Then I have these dreams and I tell the guy's dreams. And then he forgets about me and all these things keep happening. But he knew that the Lord was faithful. And he brings him up into this position. And so he starts working hard again. And they start giving out the food to all the different countries as this really bad um, famine comes. And then one day, his brothers come into town. He goes, this this is nuts, right? And so he starts messing with them. He starts doing this thing where he starts, you know, they don't know who he is because he's probably dressed in like the Egyptian guard. He starts messing with them. He takes one of the brothers hostage, sends them back to their dad. Then they have to come back. And at one point, he realizes that Benjamin, his younger brother, is there. And he tries to take him and to have him hostage. And one of his brothers, Judah, the one that said, let's sell him into slavery, he turns his life around and he says, instead of taking your brother, my brother, will you take me instead? And Joseph can't take it anymore. And he says, I am Joseph. And there's this amazing thing that happens where all of the chaos and all of the brokenness, and guys, think about how broken his life had to be. How would you trust people around you if they sold you into slavery? Because he's probably got trust issues. Probably got issues with the people that are closest to him. Think about how he feels sexually. That, man, the last time that I tried to, this lady came on to me. I'm, I don't want anything to do with it. And, and, and little by little, the Lord started bringing healing into his life. To where this moment of healing just, just shoots out of him as he yells, I am Joseph. He has this awesome reconciliation with his brothers and with his dad. And then after his dad dies, his brothers think, you're going to kill us, aren't you? Like, you were just waiting until dad was gone. Are you going to kill us? And he goes, no. Listen, guys, you thought that you sold me into slavery, but it was actually the Lord. Right? That is the way that God saved the nation of Israel was through Joseph. How, isn't that amazing that if that whole thing hadn't happened, if they wouldn't have saved this food up, that's the nation of Israel that is Joseph and his, or Joseph's family. They would have been gone. But because he was in this position of holding this food for, for these lean years that were coming, that group was able to be saved. What's the important thing for us to realize is when bad things happen to us, we can get upset on, man, why did you let this happen? When in fact, a lot of times we have to look at it and say, Lord, what is it that you're doing? Because in the chaos that we have in our lives, when we hand it over to the Lord, He has this really weird, and I have no idea how He does it, but He takes our brokenness and our chaos in the areas that we struggle and we have failed, and he just starts working them together for good. He did the same exact thing in Paul's life. Think about if you were killing Christians and then you became like the biggest Christian missionary. 
He had this way of turning things around. And that's exactly what happens with Jesus. Because in the biggest chaotic situation that was in the garden, right? we can't get in a worse scenario than everything was perfect. We had heaven on earth. Adam and Eve sin, and then we have brokenness. Now cancer and evil and all of these things dump in. Death dumps into the world. And we would all look on and say, this is the worst chaos that I can think of. It doesn't get any worse than this. But now we look back and we see, but Jesus had a plan. Because He's the Prince of Peace. And so that's where we're in, guys, is that I don't know what you've been through this week, and I don't know what you're dealing with, but what I do know, especially that I've seen in my life, is that God has this way of taking your chaos and doing the same exact thing that He did in the garden, that He did with Joseph, and that He did with Paul, is that He has a way of working it together for good.